It's a great pleasure and honor to be here at this uh, uh, outstanding symposium, and I want to thank the organizers, especially Hester Bremann, for, for inviting me. And I want to give you two examples of what we can do nowadays with, as Carla mentioned, very um, state-of-the-art machines, ultra-high-field MRI brain scanning devices, which basically um, um, are built, of course, on, on a lot of physical principles. And we use these machines to probe a physical, biophysical system, namely the living, acting human brain. And I want to show you how we can study representations and uh, underlying substrates of conscious perception using these machines in a, in a kind of very novel way. So the first point I want to make is that we um, actually link to the um, uh, dead mystery of uh, Sir Penrose's book. I mean, the book is mainly concerned about this link here, but he also, of course, touches a lot on this in the, in the current book, but also in his previous work. And um, um, so that's where we relate somehow to, although in a very modest way, we do not solve the critical uh, questions, um, what makes consciousness appearing in the universe, like whether it's a quantum process and so on, we are more modest and look at correlations between what's happening in the mind and what's happening in the brain. And the new thing is, which I want to contribute today, is that we can do this now in the human brain, where we have much better access to conscious states than, for example, in animal research, because we have achieved with these ultra-high field MRI machines a spatial resolution which allows us to see components, building blocks of the mind. And this is what I want to demonstrate in two examples today. First, uh, I want to say one thing where we fully agree with uh, Sir Penrose, uh, so his, what I call the relaxed version of his three worlds model, um, where he says there is room for other mental processes which are not uh, directly determined by the physical world. Um, um, we also think that his first model is in that sense correct. We also assume as a working hypothesis that anything mental is kind of explainable by the physical world. And in our terminology, it looks a little bit different, uh, but it's in principle, uh, in some sense, I think, uh, the same. We assume that um, uh, we have different scales of the brain, and of course, we try to relate these scales with respect to each other. And of course, this might even go down to the microtubuli system and so on. But um, what I will talk about today are the more higher level scales, system level scales of brain areas and networks. And uh, that's, there's a lot of work done in the last 20 years but I will focus mainly on the new aspects where we can zoom in a certain part of the brain and unravel what's going on there and relate that to conscious processing. So here's a little animation just showing the kind of traditional way this works. So you, for example, show something to a user who's lying in the MRI scanner and you see the brain lights up in the sense he sees now something on the right, so the left brain is active, or he sees something on the left left side, then the right brain is active, but from that activity you only know that this person sees something, but not what. And I want to show you today that we make a big progress in understanding and unraveling uh, what is in detail seen and perceived consciously. And that's this level of, um, of, of research. For that we kind of, like Carla mentioned, build a, a special um, 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 uh, um, uh, a center in Maastricht where we have access to standard MRI machines like 3 Tesla, but also 7 Tesla, even, even beyond uh, 7 Tesla, 9.4 Tesla, which are only a few in the world available. And you get very high resolution with these machines, but the most important aspect is that we get a submillimeter spatial scale. So we get a resolution which allows us to zoom in um, cortical subcompartments, like cortical layers or so-called cortical columns, which represent more specific cognitive building blocks of the mind and not just like the visual system as a whole or this brain area as a whole, but much more detailed information. And that's crucial because it allows us to establish quite specific links between a physical substrate, a biophysical substrate, the brain, uh, and uh, conscious perception. So just to um, um, start with the first example, I will now show you uh, one of two examples only. I show you now uh, how we can see um, of ambiguous stimuli, which are basically um, not changed, but changed by the, the conscious mind itself, we, we can show you for the first time in the human brain that we can understand them by these kind of high resolution, tiny clusters in a specific part of the brain, what the content of conscious is of a person. And um, to demonstrate that, 
Um, uh, here is kind of the, a simple idea. When, when, when a user in the MRI scanner sees something moving, a certain part called MT, a motion complex, a motion area in the brain, lights up. And this has been discovered by many people in the 90s already, that we have a special area system, a, a cluster of areas, uh, which is called the human motion complex, which responds when we see something moving. But this does not resolve in these early studies whether something moves left, right, or up, down. So the direction of motion is a building block inside a coding principle that we want to reveal. And uh, we did that by using these high-field MRI scanners. And it goes back to the notion that the, the, the resolution of the brain is basically, um, uh, of course, we know the scale of neurons. Um, uh, which are on the micro 10 micron scale, which you cannot measure also not with the super new MRI scanners. But we know that the neurons are clustered in cortical columns, which are kind of uh, quite similar neurons respond, for example, for horizontal bars or, or motion in this direction, uh, are separated from those which are in another direction and so on. And that resolution of these cortical columns, where Hubel and Wiesel discovered them in the visual system in Mount Castle in the somatosensory system, and Hubel and Wiesel um, got the Nobel Prize for discovering that, the spatial scale of these agglomerations of neurons, of like features, these are accessible with these high field scanners. And that's the new thing uh, I want to show you. Uh, actually, this was a, um, a meeting where I discussed this with, with, with uh, Thorsten Wiesel, and it goes back to their cell recordings, and later was discovered in optical imaging, and now we can do it all in animals, and now we can do this basically in the human brain. And just to show you that this works quite well, here is this MT system I talked before, and normally you just want to know is it active or not active, but now we can look inside and, and map this curved part of the brain flat in different depths of the cortex, and then we see these colors represent different directions of motion. So we really now unravel coding principles. And now comes uh, um, the application to consciousness. Here's now um, a physical control stimulus where um, you see these, these, these two squares move either vertical or horizontal. And of course, we map with that a subset of these high resolution features for horizontal motion and vertical motion in the brain. That's, that's the control stimulus. And now comes the conscious uh, important stimulus, which is ambiguous. So what do you see here? You might see something going like this, or you might see something going like that. Actually, both is correct, because that is an ambiguous stimulus which each of you um, perceives in a different way at different times, because it switches. After some time, now it's stopped, so you might not see anything, but stopping is good because it shows you there are just two squares on the screen. And this square is then shown here, and this square is then shown here, and it alternates. So you have no real motion at all there. It's just two stimuli which appear either here or they appear here. And your brain constructs the percept of motion. So you see it horizontally moving, but it's ambiguous. Sometimes your brain says, oh no, it might be this motion. And it's your brain which decides. And up to now, no one could predict what you perceive. Do you perceive horizontal or vertical? No one could say it. And this is what we can now do with these new approaches. We basically, uh, I show you this in an animation, we, uh, we basically see in the brain, if you look at this area, which is on both sides, that's the right hemisphere, and if a sub subject perceives the ambiguous stimulus horizontally, these red guys go up, and if it's vertically, these green guys go up. They're all resolved in a tiny part of the brain. So we can now see what is in your conscious mind by just looking in these dynamic activity patterns in a high resolution in the brain. That was example one, and uh, I now go to the example two, which is, in a some sense, even more um, exciting because we can now really visualize the mind's eye using the same machine. So if you imagine something in front of you, you see something, we can show to you what you see visually in front of you. So what I mean by that is we have um, um, an, a well-known uh, finding in, in in cognitive neuroscience, that if you have stimuli in the visual field, they have an orderly projection on the visual cortex. Here, this is the early visual cortex. That means if you have something close to your gaze, it's activating these red regions. If it's more peripheral, then it activates these other colored regions, more, more uh, peripheral regions. That's well known. The point now what I want to make is 
that we inverted that process in a sense that we look in the brain after we map from, from a stimulus is somewhere in the visual field where it activates the brain, we, de we decoded that later on. We just look in the brain and then reconstruct an image as if something comes from the outside world. But the new thing is, it's just imagined. So there is nothing in the outside world. So you imagine something, we look in the brain activity and then decode it back in a visual stimulus. Just to show you that. So here is um, actually the stimuli people see. We use this actually as a brain-computer interface for login patients. And, and the people here see first the stimuli, so they're physically on the screen. And then we decode from the brain activity these kind of stimuli back. That has been done before. Not that nice, but it has been done before. The, the cool new thing is the upper parts look a bit more noisy, but that's what we reconstruct when a person just imagines seeing a letter H, T, as C in front of their mind, there's nothing shown on the screen, and we decode what's in their mind by using very weak so-called top-down activity in the topographic visual cortex and reconstruct the stimuli. If we use modern deep learning technology in addition, which I will not go into details, we actually end up nowadays in the most recent work in these kind of reconstructed imagined images. So if you imagine letter T, we can basically see it and actually show you this in the scanner because we managed to do this in real time, close to real time, a few seconds. So can I ask something? So this is the first picture, which is pixel by pixel? Yes. And this has now probably more other variables or more matters or shape or other that's, that's where we go to. In the moment we use pixel, so it's a, a, indeed a kind of a pixel reconstruction, inverted convolution, so you have kind of a, a pattern which kind of you show in the visual field this voxel in the brain here likes the points here, and we invert that. If this is active, we back project it in the visual world, right? So that we construct them from all the activity with the amplitudes, we reconstruct how it would look like if there would be a stimulus which activates that, you know? And from that, we make this. This is re really what you get out of this, right? You see in front what you currently imagine in your mind as a real image. That's the point I want to stress. And just the last point is here you see this. Um, um, uh, strange structure, and I ask you now, because we now do this time resolved, uh, we ask a person to imagine a letter, and I want you to guess as fast as you can which letter this person imagines. Now, of course, you shouldn't be able to do it. If you now see the letter, then we have to talk. There's something <laughs> wrong. <laughs> but, but look at this, how it evolves. What is it? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, at the right time. So um, that's, that's what I wanted to show. That's the whole uh, part I will do. Of course, we want to also understand more the neural mechanisms behind that, and that's actually what Sasha von Albada will do in the second part of, of this presentation. But I hope you have seen that this new technology, which uses very, very sophisticated physics, MR physics machines, we actually uh, our moderator, Carla Miller, is an expert on, um, to probe a physical system, the brain, and relate conscious experiences with high-resolution human recordings is for the first time now possible to study that relationship in a very deep way. And that was the point I wanted to make. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Reiner. Have we got some questions? Sort of a very practical question, but does it work with color? So uh, that's a good question because the colors here are not colors which we reconstruct. <coughs> we reconstruct it without color. The color here shows just how intense certain parts of the image seem to be imagined. But we um, uh, plan in the future to really also try to reconstruct colors, but we haven't done it yet. Because our first goal is to get to shapes because we collaborate with a, co uh, actually we heard before anesthesia, but there's of course also coma uh, and so-called um, uh, wakefulness levels uh, in, in, in Liège, in Belgium, where we want to help uh, Stephen Lorries, which is the researcher there, to use this as a brain-computer interface, because he has the same seven Tesla scanner we have, and we can put the patients in the scanner who cannot talk, cannot move, to imagine letter shapes to communicate. That's the, the first application of this, because you just got funded for doing this. Okay, other questions? Yes. How specific is it for a pa for patients, so uh, if you have it for uh, adjusted to one patient, can you use it for another, or you have to? Complete? Fantastic question. Actually, that's one of the, the things we stress in the, the paper, which is um, 
basically appearing very soon. Um, um, in that paper, we stress the point that since you model this in an abstract way, you can actually more or less, if you so align the visual system from one person using curvature, actually it's a funny point you heard before, curvature is so important, it's the same here, because the, the, the position of the brain, if you box it, like, like put it in a, in a 3D volume, there varies a lot the visual cortex, but if you use the curvature, the folding patterns as a curvature and a, align brains by curvature, then you can translate from one brain, not perfectly, but pretty well, to another brain. So you can train it on one and use it on another one. These folds are all the same for, uh, more or less the same for each person. No, they're, they're very different, but, but if you, um, um, in the sense of they're, they're, some are larger, some start later, some are s like this, like that, but the, 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 the map of the, the topography of the outside world is always, for example, the calcarine salsus, the depth uh, salsus, where the, the, the horizontal meridian is always running through. So if you align the curvature, you automatically align the visual field from one brain to the other brain. Okay, thank you. Is there a connection? I mean, there's all these people with synesthesia when you get the sounds and mix up the other senses. Yeah. Mixed up. I mean, are the cells? I mean, some some <laughs> parts of the brain seem to be associated with, with hearing something, some with seeing something, or some with. I mean, they they seem very different to one con one's consciousness, but the fact that it's a different part of the brain, what's that got to do with it? Whereas if there's something actually different in the structures, and if the cells are perhaps in the wrong place, or whatever it is with synesthesia, mm -hmm. when you have people see colors, a letter maybe is a particular color or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, are the cells, well, first question is, are the cells the same, or are they different in some way when they're in different parts of the brain? So, so uh, two things. One is that a lot of reason work points indeed that the, the brains of synesthesia are slightly different. That for example, the connectivity yeah. between the m multiple modalities, the sensory input, um, is slightly different. Also, the, like the word error, we have an error when we read, although it's not evolutionary emerged, but during ontogenesis, we, we develop when we, when we learn to read between the face region and object region, an, an area called the visual word form area, which is differently connected to the senses like color, in, the, in synesthetics uh, than in, 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 in other people. But I should also stress, this work we have just published in Journal of Neuroscience, we have found that there are, in the STS, that is the, the temporal cortex, which is in between the auditory and the visual cortex, we found columns for multiple modalities lining up, first, I, first, first as a copy, so to say, like just visual, just auditory, and suddenly there come these functional clusters which only become active if you hear and see the things which match at the same time. Right. Right? So detectors for simultaneous matching. So if a dog barks, uh, uh, they, they fire. If a dog makes meow, they go down. Right? So they, they, they somehow already un analyze matching input. This is not synesthesia, I know, but uh, I read a colleague's work from mainly from the US about synesthesia and they found indeed structural differences in the brains of anesthetics anesthetics, so there is indeed something, but it's not yet, a lot of this is not understood. What we showed today is a glimpse showing how we could probably go in all these questions in the next years, okay. but this is the start of a new kind of technology for us. I might, I might just, following on from that, I think one of the, 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 the ways in which imaging has had a, a huge impact on our understanding of the sort of general ways that brain represents information is by taking structures, types of cells, for example, place cells or grid cells, Absolutely. for example, which people found sort of by sticking electrodes into one part of, of a rodent's brain. Um, and people have been able, in imaging, because you can see the whole brain, yes. and you can start to do more complex things to show that it's a very general principle of how to encode information based on, on cell type. Yeah. And it's something that you, you it would exactly. be a, an almost impossible experiment to do in a rat to actually find, you know, map the entire brain and figure out where are these types of cells. And, and I'm so happy that also with your work, of course, which helps us a lot to do this work, to, to push forward the technology that we can now have a spatial resolution in the human brain, not only in the rat, yeah. Which, which it's, it's not neuronal, but it's columnar clusters, which, which basically gives us a proxy of the coding principles. Not at the same resolution, I, I know, but we have the big advantage to relate this then to, to high-level cognitive functions. Exactly, yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, I have a, I have a gift for you, Reiner. Thank you. There we are. Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you so much. Thank you.